This week, take an immersive deep dive into the world of geopolitics with the host of the Red Line podcast, Michael Hilliard. The Red Line podcast is a Perth-based podcast that provides specific briefings on some of the most pressing geopolitical issues that aren't necessarily being focused on by mainstream media. This podcast has been hugely acclaimed by those in the know. Michael shares how the podcast is a product of his own experiences of actually travelling to unstable and war-torn countries to speak to the everyday people on the ground to understand their point of view. Michael does an excellent job of condensing his extraordinary wealth of knowledge and information to provide a summary of the major forces at play in geopolitics today, that particularly around the US, Russia and China, as well as the three major fault lines across the world currently. I think you'd be hard pressed to find such a focused insight anywhere else on the internet currently. He also provides a compelling argument as to why it is so important to understand these geopolitical issues on an individual level and how they affect your everyday life. What shines out for me in amongst what can be a wealth of anxiety provoking information is that from his journeys, Michael has seen and experienced how through our humanity, we are all the same with the same basic needs, desires, despite the country we live in. There is no real them and us which the mainstream Orwellian type media would have us believe. So enjoy, Michael. Hello and welcome back to WA Real. I'm your host, Bryn Edwards. Today, I am joined by fellow podcaster, Michael Hilliard, who has started an exciting new podcast called Red Line that is from here in Perth that's focused on giving you the real facts that mainstream media don't necessarily. Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Super. One of the questions I always like to ask right at the start, mm. because it's called WA Real, yep. is um, people's relationship to Western Australia. So you're born and bred here. I am indeed. I'm born Canadian and Canadian parents. My parents are Canadians, but I am born and bred here. I was born uh, in Gosnells, of all places, yep. uh, in a hospital that is now a car park. Well, so my mum tells me. Right. Um, <laughs> and then I was born in a car park and she's just trying to pass it off that it used to be a hospital. Um, but yes, born in Gosnells and uh, raised in Byford of all places. Tell me what it was like growing up in Western Australia. I actually grew up on a horse breeding farm. Yeah. Weirdly enough. Um, so I grew up with lots and lots of horses and farmers and adjusters and all sorts of people. And uh, dad was always at sea for a, a long time. So uh, yeah, just it was a weird upbringing of horses and farm and building things and... Uh, with dad coming home with all these tremendous stories from overseas. Excellent. Um, is it home for you? But Yes, no, Perth is home for me. Uh, I travel quite a lot, but I still base myself out of Perth. Um, I'm living up in Maylands. Uh, yeah. And frankly, no matter where I travel, Perth just has a certain quality that you don't see anywhere else. I used to do huge amounts of work on the East Coast. So you sort of uh, go to the East Coast three, four times a month. But there's just something about Perth. The people are nice. The weather's usually pretty good. People are friendly. It's cheaper to get out of Australia than it is from the East Coast. It's just generally a great place to live. Awesome. Awesome. So we'll get into the podcast in a second yeah. and, and your story behind it. Um, as I looked at the whole Michael story, there's a strong focus on wanting to get real facts of what really is going on mm. in the world. Where does that come from in so- the Michael journey? So I always grew up knowing, you know, being told that, look, even dogs are smart enough to know that it's all shades of grey. Yes. Uh, so when I see stories about, well, here's the good guy and here's the bad who, guy. Who told you that? Your dad? Or well, you my dad. But yeah. at the same time, you know, obviously being in the military and whatnot, he was very staunch, staunch, anti-communist, you know, rah, rah, rah. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, okay, well, obviously, you know, the, we're the good guys, they're the bad guys, that's how it is. It's a very simplistic, you know, Star Wars, Empire versus Jedi kind of narrative. Uh, and then the first time I... I got incredibly drunk and I accidentally booked some tickets to Russia with a good friend of mine and we went well let's go anyway you know we booked these tickets how bad could it be let's see what the other side's like and realised that everyone's pretty much the same and Mm. then so looking into you know that kind of shook me a bit going these guys are supposed to be the evil bad guys these guys are supposed to be the terrors of Europe who are out to kill us all but they were lovely and that made me kind of okay well let's start looking into the other side and talking with other people and starting to talk to both sides and you know realising that Everyone has a certain set of cards and, and geopolitical goals and everyone has, you know, everyone's just chasing the same thing. 
Uh, and often it's not good versus bad. And sometimes we are the bad guys and sometimes we are the good guys, you know. And sometimes it's the other way around. Sometimes it's the other way around. It's very hard to pick without hearing both sides and, and chasing the side, you know, the other side of the story. Was that I, quite confronting when that dropped? Isn't hugely it? confronting. Um, you know, to kind of have the entire basis of how you think. You know, I always grew up with, you know, communists bad and they're coming to get you and, you know, certain races were bad and this and this and this. And it wasn't until I got out there and went, ah, oh, okay, it's a little more complicated than that. Uh, which most even most geopolitical situations are. I mean, the more you dig into a subject and you scratch beneath the surface, it gets fiercely complicated to, directly under the surface. There's so many things, oh, well, that's just a breakaway republic. There's nothing to do. It's just a frozen conflict. It doesn't matter. And then you realize that the entire geopolitics of Eastern Europe hinges on this tiny little republic. There are so many things that a little, just dig into the surface, you realize that there's way more to it than you ever thought it possible. Hmm. Hmm. So, the Red Line podcast, where'd you get the name from? We, we end up writing like a gazillion names of just like, you know, lines and borders and geopolitics and just like writing everything that we kind of, thesaurus kind of felt like. Uh, and there was different colors and all sorts of stuff. And we eventually, like so many of them we loved, but then obviously the name would be taken or it wasn't appropriate. And then we ended up just coming up with red line. That was the kind of, okay, well, let's give it to a few people and see. And I sent it to a few journalists who work at the Times and, and a friend of mine who worked for the New York Times and said, what do you think? And they went, yep, red line's probably the better one out of those. So yeah, it was kind of a committee decision of, you know, I had uh, Michael, the producer, and myself and, and a few friends who work in the industry going, yep, that's your one. And that's how it kind of got. There's no real mm. huge story to it, really. Now, for anybody who's not heard it, mm. what's the focus? So what we do is we do a fortnightly deep dive. So we take one subject and really, really mm. nail down that subject uh, for about 45 minutes with three expert witnesses. So we've had, you know, the CIA, MI6, um, Harvard, Oxford, Cambridge, Columbia, uh, we've had authors, we've had directors, we've had BAFTA winners, you know, we take the biggest experts in that subject and really, really dive down. So rather than getting, you know, you flick Channel 7 News and you get a quick 90 second, oh, and today there was fighting in this country. You know, we go on that country and focus just on that for 90 minutes. So you can effectively use the show as a crash course. You know, you can go listen to the program and go, oh, okay. You walk out 90 minutes of 45 minutes later with, yep, I understand what's going on in Yemen and why it's happening. And what the ramifications are and where it's likely to lead or where the experts think it's likely to lead. What's the impact you want to have with this? <sighs> That's a tough one. Um, impact, impact wise, I kind of just want to keep, you know, inform people. I, I did some political work uh, mm. of some of the parties and, and, you know, even going into bars and traveling and, and, you know, seeing and meeting people around the amount of people have no idea what's going on. Like you bump into someone and you say, oh, well, obviously, you know, what's going on in Papua at the moment? They go, what's Papua? And you realize that, you know, there's this, this horrible genocide that's, you know, only 70 k from Australia that people just don't talk about. Um, you know, it, and I, I went looking for it, you know, I went looking for, uh, you know, YouTube clips or other podcasts to try and get, you know, deep dives on a subject. You know, oh, man, I'd love to know what Yemen, but I don't want to cycle through a million three minute clips from Al Jazeera and BBC where they just give you a very short, there was fighting, it was bad, end of the story. People died. People died. Oh, yeah, I don't want to go looking at, you know, have to read 400 books on the subject to get to the, the level that I would actually understand it properly. So I was kind of feeling, looking for that middle ground, you know, not quite surface, but not quite so academic where you're watching a 16 hour lecture, which I, I do enjoy at times, but sometimes yeah. I just don't have the time to watch 16 hours of, you know, what it is um, and that's where Redline came it was like man let's do a show that actually is exactly what I'm looking for mm. um, and obviously you know being I was kind of in this world anyway I have most of my friends are, are journalists or intelligence guys or you know people I met on the road um, and you know they were all saying like man let's do something and I went oh well I forgot this giant black book of you know Russian intel uh, Romanian intel German guys French guys British guys American guys and I went I should probably be using this for something rather than just drinking buddies and free accommodation <laughs> in odd countries. Hmm. So when, when did you tell me about the point of when you decided, right, we need to do a podcast and how you brought people in or was it your idea or was it friends? So it was originally my idea to, to do the show. Um, cause I was kind of, I was sitting in a bar in Uzbekistan. Yes. Uzbekistan. It was, it was a long time ago. 
uh, and chatting with a few guys there and we were chatting about geopolitics and he's like, oh, you know what you're talking about. Cool. And we're chatting about um, uh, some of the implications of the Afghanistan war. And I was like, oh, I should really do something with this knowledge and do something with it and had some friends who worked for one of the political parties going, look, you know, there's there's a lot of support out there for this. You know, if you want to go for it, I'm sure it would be a thing. I went, well, okay. Like I, I did a degree in audio engineering. I know what how to make uh, audio and stuff. I was like, I'll do, a sh- I'll do an episode. I'll see how it goes. I'll do one episode, put it out there and see if we get any attention. If it gets 20 views, I'll, I'll ditch it and throw it in the bin and we'll never talk about it again. But we did the first episode and it came out quite well and we got like 3,000 hits on the first episode and we were like, oh, okay, there is a demand for this. Mm. Uh, and then from then on in, it's just been pounding it out and, you know, Steve Morning Herald's picked it up, the Times in London's picked it up. Uh, we're getting a lot of mentions on tweets and, uh, you know, it's going fairly well. So we're pretty happy so far. So, ta- so you've alluded to it um, that you have this background mm. in um, that started with going to Russia. Mm. And then went from there. Give give me a potted history of of where Michael's been to get to this point, and some of the epiphanies along the way. So there's so many different things that sort of click your head. Yeah, like you know, the first time I went into a war zone, like a real, a, a, what would people classify as a dangerous country, was Russia, and it was yeah. it was a huge culture shock. It was, you know, I'd been to Paris and I'd been to London and I'd been to those sort of places, but mm. Russia was something different. Mm. You know, uh, it's the first place I'd had some pull a gun on me. It's the first place I'd almost been arrested crossing a border. You know, it, it was just a huge culture shock, but it was so invigorating and it was so interesting. And, and the people you meet there are just fascinating people. You know, when you go to a bar in, in downtown London, it's usually just, you know, some guy who works in finance and it's fine. But when you go to a bar in downtown Moscow, it's an arms dealer who fought in the Chechen war and has these great stories. And I went, okay. Yeah. Wow, that's way better. Than way better. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> and I was like, "Oh wow, this is you know, I really enjoy it, and I really enjoyed meeting with lots of people." Uh, and then, you know, thinking, "Oh, this is pro-Russia," and yep, yeah, this is cool. And then when I got into Latvia directly after that, I started speaking with Latvians, and I met some lovely Latvians there. I, I even went bobsledding with their Olympic team after a few drinks. It was a long story that one, um, but yeah, chatting with Latvians, and they all have bug out bags. A bug out bag. Now, a bug out bag is effectively a duffel bag you keep under your bed or in the trunk of your car that has um, uh, passports, money, cash, uh, a couple of changes of clothes. Effectively, if you have 30 minutes to leave the country, you pick up this bag and you go. Yeah. And that shocked me. Obviously, being in Australia, we're very secured you know, yeah. strategically. Uh, but Latvians all have these bug out bags. And I kind of went, oh, what's that about? And I asked, asked and asked. And I went, oh, it's when the Russians come in. And I went, oh, I just come from Russia, and I'd met all these Russian friends, and I, I, I'd got along mm. with them, and I was, you know, walking out of this thing, being like, man, Russia's a great country, and then go crossing the border into Latvia and seeing that they are all terrified of Russia, and they knew that Russia can come across the border almost at any time. And that was a huge epiphany for me that whole, that every situation has a has a winner and a loser, and every situation has mm. two sides to a story, and that that's what first triggered me to go, okay. Well, let's look into both sides. Let's travel both sides of this disputed border and, and get to talk to people and, and fully understand. Because we're so, particularly uh, Western media and Eastern media does it as well, but we do it quite dramatically, is we tend to focus on one side. You know, this guy bad, oh, yeah. this guy good. And we focus on that and we never hear the other side. Uh, and when you talk to the other side, they go, well, we're fighting because of this and this and this and this is what's happening to us. And you go, huh, that kind of makes sense. I, you know, I would probably do the same if I was in your position. Mm. Uh, and that's kind of what sparked a lot of this off, is knowing that every story has two completely different poles, uh, mm. and usually the truth is somewhere in the middle. And it's interesting what you say about you know, Eastern me- um, Western media, and we'll dive into it more, but you know, it's almost like the Orwellian 1984, where we have mm. to have an enemy yes. to galvanize us. And that's... To be you know, fair, no? The, the phrase Orwellian is thrown around a lot at the moment, but it is fairly apt. I mean, we are the in fra- the, what? the phrase Orwellian yes. uh, is for, thrown around a lot, and I think it's very apt for a lot of what's happening at the moment. You know, the US particularly is such a weirdly aggressive nation for a, for a country that was isolationist less than 100 years ago. Mm. You know, when they're uh, created as a nation, they have this, you know, the British are the enemy, the British, British, British. And then they kind of moved to the French of the enemy, and then it moved to the natives of the enemy, and then it moved to the Spanish of the enemy, and then it moved to the Mexicans of the enemy, and then it moved to the Germans of the enemy. 
and then the Soviets were the enemy, and now it's in the Vietnam Muslim, in you know, there for a the bit. Vietnam, but that was mostly a Soviet kind of thing. Yeah, uh, and now it's you know the Muslims are the enemy. Yes. You know, there's almost never been a period in, in American history where they haven't had this big external unifying force. Mm. Uh, and if you read Sun Tzu, or you read any of the you know particularly clever generals, they all tell you that the best way to unite a populace is against somebody. You know, nothing unites the tribes of Iraq than someone invading Iraq. Um, and I think the West does that quite a lot. You know, we tend to oh, don't talk about these issues that are actually hurting you know working class people and hurting a lot of people. Let's talk about this one. Uh, and that's a huge yeah. problem of Western media. Um, the all it doesn't relate to your everyday human life. No, and the the very classic, and I say this all the time in almost every interview. The thing that always rings in my mind is a is a very famous naval phrase, which is if you park a battleship in front of someone, they don't notice the aircraft carrier behind them. So you know, in Australia, the media is pretty bad for it. For instance, the when we did the gay marriage debate a couple of uh, about a year and a half ago now. Uh, the abhorrent anti-worker laws and the really bad some of the banking stuff they passed were all passed because we were all distracted with the, with the plebiscite look at this over here look at this oh, over I'm here this. don't look over here yes and this is what all it is it's look at the war look at this look at this don't look over here and this happens more and more and more yeah I mean you and know, our civil rights get eroded day of course day our day. civil rights get eroded day by day by day because they focus on little things like the other day when uh, Angus Taylor got done for, you know, uh, trying to fake documents to get Clover Moore removed from the Sydney mayor. We all kind of, we're focusing on that. And then Scott Morrison chucked out a bathroom bill and everyone just diverted their attention away. It's, it's, it, we're pretty bad for it in Australia. The Americans are almost worse than we are, but the Australian media particularly tends to just focus in on a spotlight and just focus on one thing and not you know, the best thing I can phrase that's the art of magic isn't it's it it's the art of magic I will put your attention over here while I pull no oh, exactly the rabbit from the hat over here of course and that's, the, that's exactly what magicians do and people in Australia we also tend Tricks. to focus on the what not the why yes this is what really gets me you know why, why what's happened today not why are they doing that oh he mm. wants to pass this this bill that will do this oh that doesn't seem so bad but why is he doing it oh because it will do damage down here mm. you know it's Everything is usually deeper than it is. Oh, but people tend to have the 90 second clip saying, you know, Scott Morrison passed a bill today that, you know, gives the two workers in HUD in, uh, in Upper Maroochydore a better life. It's like, okay, but what is actually in that bill? And that's a huge amount of what actually happens when you look into things. So, I guess a bit of a, a challenge for you here is mm-hmm. If our attention is being distracted by, you know, mm. good guys, good guys versus bad guys and stuff, and da, 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 mm. then when really there's some serious stuff going on, yes, right on our doorstep, then why, why, why should we be bo- why should we be bothered with geopolit- geopolitics the- when? Yeah, when there's stuff happening that's affecting us right on the doorstep. So, because geopolitics, we don't notice how much the world is connected now. We are a yeah. very, very globalized economy in a very globalized world. So, two months ago, an Iranian, uh, an Iranian-funded militia shot a, uh, a piloted a drone, sorry, into Saudi Arabia and shot a, a missile at a Saudi Aramco facility. So that's an Iranian funding a Yemeni to fire a missile at Saudi Arabia. And that put our petrol price up by 15 cents overnight, even though the majority of Australian petrol comes from Malaysia. Yeah. So people don't... Oh, geopol- Figure that then. Yeah. <laughs> Geopolitics doesn't affect me, but it does when the fuel prices go up. Yes. It does when if Saudi Arabia was to lose this war, uh, our fuel prices would double. It doesn't affect us when, for instance, the Strait of Malacca, which almost all our gas and oil comes through, yes. could be closed off. And if it gets closed off, boom, we go through an oil shortage. Particularly this country, uh, Australia has the smallest petrol and uh, uh, fossil fuel reserves of any developed nation in the world. We're sitting at 21 days. So if, let's say, they close the Strait of Malacca, which is between Malaysia and Indonesia, uh, boom, we have three weeks of fuel left, and then, and then we're completely out. Yeah. Geopolitics is incredibly important because, you know, being a globalized world, if someone catches a cold, oh, sorry, if someone sneezes, we catch a cold. Yeah. And you can usually see what's coming up. Uh, you know, before it happens. Yeah. So, for instance, you know, just to bring it back to a real world scenario, I know I watched that 
the strike happened in, in Saudi Arabia and I went, ha, I'm going to fill my car right now because I know this is going to put our petrol price up. And lo and behold, in the morning, up 15 cents. Um, you know, and this is putting more instability in the market. And again, to put it back to geopolitics, how it affects you. Remember, the global financial crisis started in the US. Yes. You know, it didn't start here, but it affected us. And, and there is another one coming. And oh, yeah. Huge amounts. We're seeing so many warning signs. Last time we bailed out the banks. We did bail out the banks. We were bailed out the banks by the central monitor, with the, the federal banks. Yes. Who's going to bail out the federal banks? The Federal Reserve has a, has a, a decent amount of money, uh, and we did do a big episode on this for the show. Uh, so we talked to Harvard's economists, and we talked to the guys who predicted the last GFC, and we talked to mm. housing guys, and we talked to government ministers about this. Um, what worries me is last time when the, when the whole financial system almost collapsed, and it would have collapsed had the Chinese really gone for it. So there were talks between, at the time, uh, China's leadership and Russia's leadership saying, we should go for the jugular. We should sell all our US bonds right now and flood the US market, and that will destroy the bond market, and that will push the US even further into the ground. It was only the Chinese who said, no, let's not do that, because I think it may actually hurt the Chinese stock exchange too much. Um, that stopped that happening. Hmm. We got through it because we had large cash reserves. You know, we had a decent... We Australia. Australia did. But the world generally got through it because we went through a unified monetary policy. You know, we had uh, Angela Merkel. We had uh, Gordon Brown at the time. We had uh, uh, Barack Obama. You know, we had internationalist politicians who were very... Okay, well, let's unify our policies together and we can weather this storm. And we did. We got through it the skin of our teeth and we bailed out the banks which I don't fully agree with but you know it made some mm. fiscal sense this time if it happens for instance Australia when we went into the last one there was the interest rate was very high and we had lots of money in reserve and we had a, a good amount of surplus going this time we don't we have no cash reserves we're far more in debt than we were back then and our interest rate is already at 0.25% which means that we have effectively all the ammunition we would use to fight off a recession we no longer have. Yes. So we're going into, rather than going into battle with, you know, artillery and horses and men and guns and bullets, we're now walking in with a backpack and a, you know, Burn roll of gaff tape. Um, so yes, it's, it's worrying. And this is what geopolitics is going to do because if China coughs particularly, that's Australia, mm. we're, we're done for. Um, yeah. So what, um, so if someone's listening to this and they're all of a sudden like, holy crap, I need to talk paying more attention to geopolitics. What are some of the, if you're starting from standing start, yeah. what, is, what are some of the, like, the top three or five things you need to know? I think, to understand? The, obviously the- Because you are well into it. I, I'm, I'm very- You're very, well into it. I'm well into it. I'm obviously, I don't and expect people to be looking at the Kyrgyzstani elections coming. No, no. Um, but also you're putting content out. Yes. With the view to enable Yes. Some sort of thing. And, you know, there's another question I have, which is what do you want people to do with the information? So I think people being better formed always, you know, always helps because people can either help out, you know, they can either uh, work for NGOs or they can help out or they even can just, you know, influence other people. Something that's really interesting when you read some of the work from Marshall Gans, who has done a lot of the work in the Obama campaign, uh, and some of these really, really good campaign guys, particularly even Cambridge Analytica stuff, is if you can convince one person who's an influencer in the family or influencer in the friends, they often go on to influence lots of other people. So for instance, if you have a family that doesn't follow politics because you know we don't talk about politics at the dinner table, um, but you know the younger, the oldest son goes off and he learns about what's going on in Afghanistan and they come to a family barbecue and he chats, then you've just made 10 people aware of the situation yeah. and it expands from there. You know, they go on to a book club or whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. and expands. You know, a lot of the, the big things, you know, we, you know, a lot of even the banking commission stuff that came out for Australia wasn't talked about a lot outside of a very few circles of people who were informed, but that spread and that actually became a national issue very quickly uh, because people were informed and they were informing their friends. And by having a crash course, not only can you go, this is bad, but when your dad or whatever follows up and goes, why is it bad? You go, because of this because of this rather than seeing the 90 second BBC clip where you go mm. oh Afghanistan is bad well why is it bad I don't know it just is and that doesn't influence anyone you know you've got to be able to have your argument and back it up too it runs dry very quickly it runs dry very quickly um, so back to my other question mm. someone's 
hitting it from a standing start? What's the top five things we need to understand? So the top five things, I think, the world, I always look at the world a bit like a Christmas party. Yeah. There are th- there's a kid's table and there's an adult's table and there's a sitting at the back in the paddling pool. So the adult's table is the, the big power players. Yeah. Uh, that would be China, Russia, and the US. Effectively, almost every single country in the world reports to one of those three yes. in some way or another. Then there's the smaller kids' table where you get regional powers. You, know, you get your Iran, you get your Saudi Arabia, you get your Brazils, your Indias. They're kind of powerful, but outside their region. I mean, India doesn't have a particularly big you know, influence on, on Guatemala, for instance. It's very much regional. Australia is kind of in that bracket as well. Yeah. You know, if you understand the general way and what the general goals of what those big three, the adults table is, that's mm. a great place to start. Yeah. So when something happens in the world, let's say... Sorry, who's in the paddling pool? In the paddling pool are your, you know, they don't really affect anything. You know, Nauru doesn't really affect much. New Zealand doesn't really affect too much. Um, I'm sorry to my Kiwi friends and listeners, but, um, you know, uh, countries like, you know... Uh, you know, really small ones like Zambia, for instance, uh, New Zealand, Nauru. Hmm. Um, they're very, very small countries and they don't make a big wave. I mean, yeah. you know, no one really, if New Zealand was to panic, it wouldn't affect too much outside of its very, very small area of uh, influence. Hmm. So if you understand what the three big players, so China, Russia, and America are trying to go, and you can then look through that through every situation. You know, Venezuela, let's take that for instance. Who gains if Venezuela gets booted out of power? Well, that's the Americans. And then from there, you can start to sort of unravel. Well, the Americans in Venezuela as well is really interesting because Venezuela holds the largest oil reserves on the planet. Right. Like, not many people realize that. And it's, right now, it's in right in the America's backyard. Yeah. You know, and effectively, they can have these huge oil reserves and America goes, well, the government's not that stable at the moment. And it's the old, well, if I kick the rotting door, will the whole house come down? And if the house comes down, then they can they can uh, buy out Petaveros, which is the state oil company over there, uh, and effectively, you know, have this huge oil reserve that would make them, you know, you know, very, very, very rich in that field. Along with the petrodollar. Along with the petrodollar. But at the same time, it's not only just about what they want, it's about keeping the others out. Mm. Um, you know, if the US, if let's say it does collapse, you know, China and Russia are already moving in on that. So do you really want a huge oil exporter right on your doorstep who will likely supply most of South America and decrease their dependence on the US? No, the US are desperate to make sure that doesn't happen. Mm. Uh, and that's kind of what it is. You've got to make sure, you've got to look at it from that, what those big three are doing mm. and go, oh, well, who, who gains from that? And who would gain from that if it went the other way? So what are the sort of primary drivers of the three? Money. Almost always. Money and influence. So, for instance, China will... Uh, and how are they going about it? Very, very, very... very so, very, very differently. Go on. So, the US tends to do things by financial. Uh, it's financial and hard power. So, for instance, they'll put bases in countries. They will supply a lot of the arms to the countries. Or they'll just straight up fund the opposition, like we're seeing in Chile and Bolivia. Oh, um, you know, the US overthrow governments all the time. It's, hmm. it's just what they do. Uh, and effectively, they can run gumbo diplomacy. So, for instance, if, let's say, a country like Panama or Grenada goes, we're going to have an anti-US government come in, the US will park a battle group outside them and go, <clears throat> I don't think so. The US has that power because they are the you know, effectively the foremost air, sea, and navy power in the world. Hmm. China is, is kind of does things by, by uh, money and also markets. So what China will do is usually to do with their Belt and Road Initiative, which is effectively their their Belt and Road Initiative. It's the big plan in China. It's effectively their 20-year plan going forward. So And that is? uh, That is effectively to build up Chinese influence through everything in in Asia and the Middle East, Africa, and buy up all these ports. So to go back, the, the classic example here is Tanzania. So in Tanzania, which is on the east coast of Africa... The U.S. came in and they were like, oh, we're going to spend $100 million in Tanzania. So they bought a heated swimming pool for some of the soldiers based there. And they bought a lot of nice cars for some of the leaders there. And then they bought, you know, I I think it was something else ridiculous. I think it was a zoo or something. Just a waste of money. Um, But it made a few rich people in Tanzania very happy, who those people then vote pro-U.S. China, on the other hand, is going in and they bought railroad schools, highways and infrastructure repairs. Uh, and 
the schools is the important one because those schools are now funded by China and China is now saying, well, maybe in your textbooks, maybe teach a bit more Chinese pro stuff. And because of it, now China effectively has the entire undercurrent class in, in Tanzania as pro-China. Mm. Now China then you know, can be easy to win elections and those elections can then open up mines for them, ports for them, mm. uh, as well as the Chinese tend to do another thing that we've seen in Sri Lanka and Pakistan particularly, uh, where they will lease you a bunch of money. They'll say, hey, look, you want to build this giant port? Here's all the money you could ever want. And they do. And the money comes in and it loses a huge amount of corruption because that's kind of the, how it works. How it works. Uh, and then they go, well, we can't pay back the money, China. And China goes, oh, well... I guess I'll take that port then. And they get the port leased to them for 99 years. Yeah. So effectively now China has this huge port in, in Guada, which is in Pakistan, and another huge one in, in Sri Lanka, where they have these amazingly huge military capable ports that effectively the Chinese only paid about half for because they paid the money to get them built and then effectively got them back for almost free because they got half their loan back and they got the port. So then they're sneaking out these ports. And yes. Bases. Yes. So if, if you go back, and obviously this would take it back right to sort of 16th, 17th century history, what the, the Portuguese and the Spanish and, and the Dutch used to do is used to build all these little ports all around the trading areas so they could make what they called a string of pearls. You know, they could go from one port to the next with safety and they can control the sea lanes. China's doing that now. You know, remember only, what, four or five years ago, just before Trump came in, Xi Jinping gave a press conference in Beijing where he says, the US are imperialists, rah, rah, rah. we would never put military outside the Chinese Republic. And I went, okay, cool. But just in the last three years, they've made military bases in uh, Pakistan, uh, Sri Lanka, Cambodia, Zan- uh, Zambia, Mozambique, uh, mm. the Philippines, the Spratleys. Uh, they've just opened up another one up in Djibouti. I mean, the Chinese are expanding like crazy at the moment. Is that why we have an airport up in northern Western Australia? See, that was an interesting one because I got really interested in that one because I got spammed with that Palmer ad as well. Funny enough, the airport that Palmer was complaining about is actually owned by a Palmer subsidiary. Sinotech? Uh, uh, Sinotech? Mm. Um, the company. They effectively got in this country because of Palmer. Palmer was uh, lobbied for them when he was in Parliament to get the licenses to start digging here. Uh, in fact, Palmer was one of the main guys who got the 457 visa program through as well, which allowed Chinese to hire their own workers and yeah. their own geologists and their own guys to come in. Because obviously the Chinese want their own geologists because then they can dig and go, well, there's nothing here, but we'll buy it for, you know, buy it for cheap when there's actually... A round of drinks. Yeah, we'll buy it for a round of drinks stuff. and boom, there's a bunch of uranium in the ground. We. Um, but yeah, the, air, the airport up north is a red herring. It was not military capable at all. And even if you were to land a jet on it, 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 it why would you? Mm. Because if it, to take a Chinese jet, for instance, and talk yeah. about that port up there, if a China was, if China, let's say, takes one of their southernmost airfields, like Guangzhou, uh, and then launches this airplane, has to make it over the whole Spratly Islands against the US Navy, which dwarfs the Chinese one. Yeah. It has to make it over Vietnam, which is a very US friendly ally. It has to make it over Malaysia, which is a US friendly ally. It has to make it over Indonesia, where we give them a buttload of anti-aircraft missiles to make sure that nothing makes it over there. By that point, it probably needs a refuel, to which the Chinese don't have a good refueling capability air force. Yeah. Uh, and at the same time, it won't make it, even if it gets to, even if it made it all the way to Australian you know, territorial land, mm. which it wouldn't, but if it did, it runs out of fuel. And then you either park it on the tarmac and then you just have this free Chinese plane with no fuel in it. Or it's going to just bomb and then go, well, I can't do any. I can't get back. So it either has to drop its payload and then stop. Um, the airport was almost useless. It would be only useless if you followed up with an invasion force. And the Chinese do not have an amphibious invasion force capable of it. We're going to go back to Russia in a minute. But while we're on the thread of things up north in Western Australia, mm. does Western Australia hold any strategic advantage to yes. any of those three? Yes, uh, Australia. Let alone Australia. Yes, but we are. Western Australia actually does hold a huge strategic value because effectively we are the most friendly US ally on the Indian Ocean. Uh, you know, Australia, particularly Perth, Exmouth, uh, Karatha, and you know some of these big ports up there, you can use to not only stash huge amounts of supplies, but you can also bring in large deep water vessels, and you also have a capability to project power onto East Africa. Mm. You know. It's a, what, what you find often with naval warfare is it all, it's all about choke points. 
So for instance, Indonesia holds a huge amount of power because most of the time when you drive through Indonesian waters or through the archipelago, you know, you'll have, you know, let's call it 10K of open water with mountains on either side. And those mountains and jungles can hide anti-tank and anti-aircraft missiles and anti-ship missiles particularly. So when you're driving through, you, every time you put a tanker through mm. there, you risk the you risk someone blowing that tanker up. Yeah. And the insurance could, you know, goes up exponentially because of that. Whereas if it's beautiful open water, you know, if, if let's say you drive from, uh, you know, Perth to Madagascar, you have a million ways you can go because it's just open water and it's much harder to find you and it's much yep. easier to skirt around things. Mm. You know, you not when you let's say going through a tiny little choke point where everything has to go through this tiny little you know, 10k wide area, you just park your satellite there or you park your you know your, your anti ship missiles there. Someone's got to come through eventually. So Australia is this wonderful. Australia has this wonderful large western coast where we can get large amounts of resources out to uh, strategically important fronts. Uh, we can also use it to project power onto East Africa and as well as the Middle East. Uh, and we have huge amounts of strategic resources for very important things like steel, uh, as well as large air bases we can use to uh, cause the Chinese some hell in uh, in the Southeast Asia air region. Hmm. So we were going through the three. Yep. America very much money and hardware. Yep. China very much finer, uh, money, markets, and consumer goods as well consumer goods but also um, building these sneaky ports and stuff they build sneaky ports as well as sneaky they, ports like yeah, sneaky ports sneaky ports and airports yeah, I've never heard a, a multi-million dollar port we call a sneaky port but yeah I like it but I'm, I'm like going to keep, keep, keep using it um, it's sneaky um, and then we have Russia Russia is a much harder power scenario so if you look at the sort of they're starting to get off that now but if you look at the days of the Soviet Union mm. it, like Russia had no influence on, on, let's say, a French election. Yeah. You know, they could bang their chest and go, bah, 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 we're very strong with the Soviets, so we can invade you and we could be in Paris in 12 days. But they know that's the end of the world if they do yeah. that. So then no one did it. They can't really influence anything outside their very, very limited sphere of influence. That's what it used to be anyway. So, for instance, Russia completely controls what happens in Belarus and Kyrgyzstan and yeah. Uzbekistan and those kind of guys, but doesn't have any influence, or used to, on France. These days are different. Russia is ahead of the game of us on cyber warfare. Right. Uh, what if, what used to be called the KGB is now called the GRU. Yes. Uh, and they are very, very good at what they do. Yeah. So they can hack election booths. I mean, it, we all talk about that Russians couldn't hack the US election. But when they ran a competition in, uh, in Russia, just to you know, annoy the Americans, they took an American voting booth uh, that the Americans claim was unhackable and they hacked it in 12 minutes. Russia can do things, they've already claimed, proven they can turn power grids off, they can open dams, they can do a bunch of things as well as influence. So you find a lot of bots. Uh, so when a Twitter hashtag comes out, you know, mm. like for instance, let's take Donald Trump, for instance, you know, almost somewhere between a third and half of his Twitter followers are not real, they're bots. Russia makes these sock accounts and they just flood every hashtag with whatever they want their, their strategic purpose to be. You, know, you never see quicker action than when Trump says, oh, maybe we should pull out of NATO or maybe we should do stop helping the Ukrainians. And then boom, the amount of bots that hit the, hit the sphere in, in less than two hours mm -hmm. uh, talking about, you know, proving the Ukrainians and the Americans don't care. I mean, I don't think most farmers in Iowa care about what happens in eastern Ukraine, but the Kremlin sure does. Mm. You know, Russia is very good at influencing elections uh, with large amounts of bots, large amounts of, of fake political money, money as well. So they're also very good at pinpointing certain campaigns. So let's take the British election, which is coming up. The Brexit party, which is the sort of close to our one nation, but not really. They're just mostly focused on Brexit. Seven of the 10 biggest donors of the Brexit party are Russian oligarchs. Uh, the Believe campaign as well was largely financed by Russian money. Uh, Donald Trump took large amounts of Russian money and uh, you know some of the left-wing parties do as well uh, but the Russia pinpoints them to make whatever is going to be the best for Russia mm. they spend they, they don't have a lot of money at the moment so they spend very very wisely so you know they'll, they'll fund you know certain campaigns in Ukraine to make sure that Zelensky got in who's a comedian because he knows that Zelensky will be the easiest to bully around he won't be taking orders from you know he takes orders from oligarchs not the US I mean, he takes, doesn't take orders from Washington or, or Moscow he takes orders from oligarchs which are far easier to bribe 
you know, Russia is very, very good at pinpointing little things and screaming them out to big things. So they were very good at, for instance, targeting in the French election, Marine Le Pen, who is a very far right, yeah. uh, you know, very anti-immigrant campaign. And they gave her a huge megaphone. Mm. You know, they got her onto every Russian thing they could, you know, RT and all the subsidiaries that they, they, they have, uh, but also funded huge amounts of money into her campaigns. They funded huge amounts of money against her opponent's campaigns. Um, even some of these, you know, patriots of America uh, kind of just got done for being completely based in Moscow. Uh, Russia is very, very clever at what they do and they do it. We're not as affected about it in Australia. We're more affected by the Chinese election meddling. Um, but Russia is very, very good in Europe. They know what they're doing and they're moving very well. Um, this very, like What they're doing in particular places like Romania, France, Germany as well, um, is they, they will take whatever party they think could cause the most internal damage and they will fund that party because they know that whilst we're all focused on, you know, focus on that battleship, they can move the aircraft carrier. So while we're all focused on, you know, Trump's tweet of the day, the Russians have moved back and got their influence back into in the Middle East. They've got it back in Central Asia and they're coming, they are launching their hypersonic missile program. They've got this, their strategic cyber program down as well. We're not paying attention to that because we're focused on Trump's tweets, which I think is ridiculous. Right. Um, this is what Russia does. They're very good at throwing, you know, you know, throwing a stink bomb in the room. And while you're cleaning it up and arguing on whom, who farted, they'll be in the other room, you know, stealing your TV and your couch. Yeah. That's what they do. So where are the major fault lines then? This in, is a question. In, 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 in the world. In the world, right. So the, th- the three things I think could absolutely blow the world up mm. uh, and the three things that keep me up at night. Uh, one, uh, I'd say we'll do it in order of the ones that scare yeah. me from, uh, from least to most. One is obviously the American economy. Uh, if the American economy goes, the Chinese economy goes, and the Chinese economy goes, all of us go. Uh, China is having huge problems with their banks at the moment. You know, they've lied about what their GDP is worth. Yeah. They're buying up huge oodles of, of the smaller banks because their, de- their banks are so debt ridden um, that they're mm. about to fold and China can't be seen to have banks folding. And if China and if, the Australia, if China goes, Australia's gone. Like we now have 70% of our exports tied in with Chinese or Chinese subsidiary companies and countries. Uh, so if we lose, if they implode and when China implodes, they implode into like six different countries. Whew, that's our economy gone almost overnight. Uh, so that obviously terrifies me a bit because the US one will go and I don't know if we can dig ourselves out of it again you know the last time at least when the financial crash came you know we managed to dig our way out of it because the Chinese were still strong and they were still buying American goods I don't think they will be if they implode the other big one is Yemen we don't talk about Yemen at all um, but right now the main reason Yemen's fighting so Yemen is a five-way war and it's nonsense and it's a whole bunch of nonsense. But right now the Houthis who control sort of the top left-hand corner of Yemen have these things called Scud missiles. Now this is the first country to ever have Scud missiles that is not a state country. So they're not a government, you know, they're not the government of Yemen. Mm. It's just a rebel group. Scuds were first put in the news during the first Gulf. Yes. I seem to remember the Scuds. The Scuds are effectively, you can, you can launch them hundreds and hundreds of kilometers and they hit a target pretty dead on. Yeah. So Saudi Arabia is, is paranoid and, and really as they should be because Iran has a bunch of Scuds on the south coast of Iran, which is across from Saudi Arabia. It's only mm. a very short distance. And in the 70s, they built all the desalination plants. Saudi Arabia has no lakes, no water, no rivers. Yeah, they rely almost completely on desalination. Yeah, now these things take six, seven years to build as well. The, they went, they started freaking out because the Iranians went, "Well, we can shoot those desalination plants, and if the water goes, that's Saudi Arabia gone." Done. Now that the scuds are based in West Yemen, if they they can hit all the West Coast ones as well. So if Saudi Arabia, Iran, sorry, was to make a big, yep, let's do it, and they launch all the scuds and took out all the desalination plants in Saudi Arabia. The country only has a water supply of 12 days. Mm. Now, if you were to tell Australia even and say, yeah, we have no water, 12 days, bone dry, what do you think people are going to do? They're going to panic dramatically. And if that panics, I mean, we saw one facility attacked and the oil price went up by 15 cents. Can you imagine yeah. if Saudi Arabia, the Achilles heel of the world effectively, was to go? That is a nightmare scenario. And that's why everyone is so desperate to sort Yemen out because if that goes hot, 
Mm. And they get these desalination plants. Saudi Arabians will flee because the country won't have any water. And we will see Saudi Arabia collapse and it will take the oil market with it. But the one that really worries me and absolutely terrifies me is India, Pakistan. Right. That is the big one. That is the one that when I speak to US guys who work in the White House, or I speak to guys who work uh, at Bletchley Park, or I speak to guys who are very, very clever, they all say India, Pakistan. Above the other two. Above the other two. Way above the other two. They're the one. In your they've pa- been simmering. Pardon? They've been simmering. They are simmering. They're always simmering. They're, I was going to say simmering for a long time. Yes. But there's a difference of scenario coming up. Mm. Right now, with climate change, uh, the... Pakistan has the Indus River. It's effectively this giant river that runs from the top to the bottom. It gives the entire country their water. They rely almost completely on this river. Now, that's usually fed by the monsoon. The monsoon feeds it, and it gives water to all of India. No, Pakistan, sorry. But that monsoon is moving dozens of kilometers south every single year at the moment. And it's exponentially getting further away. There are bits of Pakistan that are already starting to feel the drought. And this monsoon is now moving into the Indian desert, which is now flooding bits of you know, uh, Western India. So there will come a point sometime in the next 20 to 30 years when Pakistan will run out of water and they will have, now Pakistan always tends to have very nationalist governments in, you know, effectively the biggest, best way to get elected in Pakistan is you're running on a fuck India platform. And the best way to get elected in India is run on a fuck Pakistan platform. So you're bound to have almost always have a very, very anti the other governments in both, in both Islamabad mm. and New Delhi. When that water moves out of Pakistan and those people will start to riot because there will be no water, the Pakistani government will have one choice. They either have to invade India and take their water fields because they now have flooded uh, flooded plains in the west of the country, or they let their people die of thirst. And I can tell you which one they'll go with. They'll make that quick bump and they'll go for the water and India will respond. Now, Pakistan has a problem with its geography that if if India pushes and they get past the border, Pakistan has effectively this mountains that narrow into a choke point. And it's very close to the border. But if you get through that choke point, it's then an open plain to to the capital. So Pakistan knows that the moment the tanks and the Indians and the artillery get through that little gap, Islamabad is going to fall. And they will not be kind to the Pakistanis when they get there. Mm. So there will be a bunch of generals going... Well, if we quickly nuke them, maybe we get away with this thing. And remember, both India and Pakistan have nukes. Mm. And the moment those nukes fly, it involved that because of the mutual trade agreements and mutual alliances, China's involved, America's involved, Russia's involved. All three of the big guys come into the fight. And then both America and China will be looking at each other going and having the same conversation that, you know, some of the, uh, you know, um, I'm trying to remember, Truman had with his generals uh, you know, after the end of World War II. Well, he's got all these nukes pointed at us. And if America nukes first, maybe we can get 90% of the Chinese nukes while they're on the ground still. Mm. But if we, you know, and if, but what if we don't? Maybe they launch first and they get 90% of ours. And then it's a use them or lose them situation. Mm. And you've got a bunch of nukes flying between India, Pakistan, America, China, and the whole world just <laughs> implodes at that point. Mm. Um, all because the water drains in Pakistan. And that water is draining. That water's getting worse, and the monsoon's moving south, and we've got 25 years to figure out this. Sorry to sound so alarmist, but yes, that was... No, well, I actually were the that, three that, biggest That's bolts. the three big ones that I would look at. Right? That would, that's, but that's the reason I drink. Where do you see... Where do you see all this going? The world tends to stick towards the status quo, uh, and you know, I'm not... You know, I don't have a crystal ball. Uh, you know, there are so many things that if you told me 20 years ago this is what the world is I would go no uh, but it does the world changes dramatically and we, it's very hard to predict I can see a financial crash coming there's so many warning signs on that one I don't know how bad it would be um, mm. again a lot of things hinge on for instance the next US election they hinge on whether China's Belt and Road lasts if they can get the Belt and Road off the ground before the uh, Chinese economy comes to a, a screeching halt uh, it depends if if Putin if when he dies or leaves, actually manages a transition of power. He or died if, before leave, by the looks of it. <laughs> that's what they're worried about. Because if he, yeah. you know, Russia is so tied into Putin that effectively yeah. if he dies, you know, all the biggest companies, Roshnev, Barshnev, a bunch of these guys are all just friends of Putin. Yeah. So if he dies, they lose all their power and there will be a giant vacuum of power. And when there's a vacuum of power, we see what happened to Russia in the 90s, which is just all that anarchy nonsense. Yeah. Um, 
so yeah, it, it, there's too many factors to kind of pick where the world's going. But I think I have faith in humanity at times. And I think we can probably try and figure it out. But at the same time, there's a lot of dark clouds on the horizon that have very difficult questions to answer. So how do you talk, how do you talk people through absorbing all this? Because I've had somebody on the podcast before who talked about, he's very passionate about the environment, mm. et cetera, et cetera, yes. and nature. And yet when we, it's easy to, you know, in the world of virtue signaling, it's easy mm. to um, go, yeah, the environment's really important to me. But then the actual changes to make it happen. Yes that stark reality means that things get pushed to one side. And and because half of truly understanding what's happening pardon me, with the environment is that we have to reflect on our own behavior and it comes home mm. that we're all part of it. And then that can be very confronting and triggering and, and, and all of that. And then that's when it gets pretty fucking uncomfortable. Yes. So there would be the same here with you, what you're doing, what you're condensing into your 45 minute, yes. you know, briefings, you know, don't get me wrong. I totally see why they're necessary. Yeah. I totally understand why you're doing them, having sat and listened and yeah. absorbed that. But to get this information so somebody is able to fully listen, absorb, let mm. it settle, as uncomfortable as that might mm. be, then be okay with that being uncomfortable yes. and then being confident enough to go and go and sit in the barbecue and hold the discussion. You know, I, you go back 10, 15 years ago, I used to, I got into reading a whole load of Noel Chomsky yep. and, and that was, that was incredibly you know, enlightening and mm. educating and what have you. But also it created a whole lot of panic, anger, depression, anxiety yes. within me at the same time how would you suggest that somebody who listens to this and most importantly your podcast how do they manage their way through that journey so what you produce actually lands so it can be useful so obviously we always encourage people to go do more research into it but yeah. you know we break up the show so we make sure there's three different guests and we make sure that the first guest usually is a good uh, table setter as we call it you know, someone who can give you, you know, this is what the country is. This is what they're like. This is kind of a, you know, if I was to describe it on a plane ride, that's how I would. Uh, and then I give you the problem and then we give you the solution. You know, here's what, how this problem could technically could probably be solved. And this is what okay. you can do. So we tend to lay it out that way. Yeah. You know, uh, intro, problem, solution. Uh, and again, if you have the solution to it, when someone, you know, you get into this conversation with, with your father, your uncle, your brother, your sister, you have can go, well, you know, there is, it's a terrible, terrible situation. But if we do this, there might be an option of doing it. And again, the, the idea is trying to spread that because if we mm. just bury ourselves in not talking about it and being continuing the problem of, of just, you know, just having another podcast that reviews the Joker, um, you know, it doesn't solve anything at least this way you know we're getting lots of listeners we're getting sort of 6,000 7,000 listeners mm. an episode at the moment um, you know and those people are probably going off and, and talking to their friends and talking to their family and talking to people you know and actually when it comes up for debate you know we're watching you know for instance in the US you know I'm not a particularly fan of Andrew Yang but that's a guy who has one issue it's just universal uh, basic income uh, mm -hmm. and he's managed to get that on the mainstream platforms because he's just talking about it and talking about it and pushing it out and people were you know telling their friends and you know that went from a what a what a pipe dream that would never work to now he's on the main stage and chatting about it this is an this is a real issue and this is the point this is what we're trying to do with the podcast you know people don't talk about yemen even though that it is it could be the end of the world there um and we just want people to kind of keep bringing it up you know when they meet their local politician ask what's your thing on yemen yeah you know when they meet their family and friends and they say well, what's the what's this country? What's our government's policy on Yemen? Well, I might vote for him because he's actually got a better policy than him. Um, mm. You know, it's small incremental things, and at least you, as, even if you make a small dent, 
you know, mm. you're still moving in the right direction. Mm. You know, I'd rather be, you know, even the guy who walks the laps is still lapping the guy on the couch. Yes. Mm. Yes. I mean, you must get a lot of this where, you know, just being around you, I can feel your energy and passion for this topic and getting it out of mm. there. Um, but when you engage people in a conversation, you must get to the place where people just start glazing and you're like, fuck, this is so important. But now you're glazed. You yes. shut down. I've maxed you out. Yes. And, and believe you me, I get the same thing because I yeah. go down the rabbit hole and this is what I do yeah. on the podcast. And um, actually, part of the reason why I had to create the podcast was, was trying to have these conversations with people yeah. you know, that I knew in the pub and stuff like that. And they got fucking fed up with me. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm a lot calmer person outside yeah, yeah, the podcast because yeah. I get my fix of deep and meaningful conversation. Yeah. But how do you deal with that? You look, I always try and bring it right home for them. You yeah. know, the classic, you know, why should I care about Yemen? Well, your petrol price went up because of it. Yeah. Oh, it affects me. Yes, it does affect yeah, yeah, yeah. me. And bring it in and try and, you know, mm. and what would you do in this situation? And what, how would you react if this was your family? And, and, and this is going to, this could be, do this to you. This could put your double the petrol price. That's usually a really good one. People, it pricks people's attention up and goes, oh, right. Yeah. Uh, okay. This oh, actually, hello. this yes. actually could affect me. Mm. You know, some issues won't affect people, uh, obviously, in that country. And we have got listeners from all over the country, mm. all over the world. In fact, most of our listeners are in the US, weirdly enough. Um, but yeah, it, it's one of these things that you don't think it'll affect, but sometimes it does. I mean, I, I just had a, a meeting with a federal senator from Australia who just went, I listen to the show. I've got you recommended from a few people. Uh, would I love you to come and jump on the electoral uh, interference commission uh, based on the show, which I thought was really cool. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you, you don't think it'll affect people and then you realize it will because, you know, if you, mm aren't being aware of the situation and why things are happening you just let it braze over you oh yeah you know, Saudi Arabia's bombing it yeah they're probably doing it for some reason oh that's why they're doing it okay I can get it now now I understand it a bit more yes and yes it, it, going out and talking with people is, is yeah. you know last week I got caught a communist and a fascist in the same week um, <laughs> so you know it's always the fun people you meet um, yeah yeah particularly US panel shows where they're so quick to jump to the aggression it it there, there is that I find, you know, with, with what I do here in that you, you're putting out, mm. it's almost like you're putting out the signal. Yes. And when people are ready, they'll listen to it. Yes. And when they don't, they won't. Of course. And that's, that's yeah. kind of the point. We make I'm these... always intrigued. Yes. And so for one podcaster to another who's going to a place that mainstream media that most people enjoy, like chewing gum. Yes. Um, don't, doesn't provide. Mm. I'm always interested to have a discussion about how you almost choke the red pill down people's throat. <laughs> yes. And it, it's, you know, you obviously got to start people with little bits of, you know, yeah. the great question uh, you always ask someone is, who benefits from that? Yes. Why would they do that? Because no one does things by accident. Yeah. You know, all these, a laugh. you know, oh, China just happened to build an island here. Oh, they must be doing a holiday resort. No, 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 no. That is an airbase, my friend, full of sand missile, oh, surface to air missile sites. You know, everything happens for a reason. And there's mm. usually you can pick what's out. Oh, oh, I'm just going to pass this tiny little legislation. Oh, it, it doesn't affect anyone. It only affects this one guy. Oh, but they're going to use it to springboard into something way worse in six months. Yes. And a lot of these things can be stopped early. You know, it, it's one of the, the going back to that airbase thing, you know, people like President Obama, if they had just stopped some of this Chinese expansion, nipped in the butt when they first talked about it, we may not be in this situation today. Hmm. You know, if you let things snowball, they get worse. And I think the best thing you can do is inform enough people that, you know, when they go in and call people and this actually becomes an, an issue, it has to come on the electoral, you know, when it has to come up as an issue. Hmm. Um, you know, it's not terribly exciting for a lot of people, but, you know, I don't expect everyone to listen to the show. Um, but I know from, you know, uh, there are a lot of guys who are in journalism listen to it and a lot of guys who are in politics listen to it. And those are people who actually do make decisions a lot of the time. So, yeah, it's, it's been very interesting to kind of go hang out political fundraisers and whatnot. And, oh, yeah, I watched your show. And, yep, I agree. I'm going to be looking into that. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's maybe it won't get the biggest numbers in the world, but maybe it will get the more influential numbers in the world. You mentioned earlier on about having faith in humanity because you could get, you yourself could get quite amped up with the distillation and the vastness of the information mm. that you take on board. Yes. Where do you see signs of that? 
Def, like I, I, the more you dig into things, the more you don't understand, and that's why I have experts on the show rather than myself. I mean, I, I think I know a little bit, but yeah. generally I go to the expert, the tippy tippy top, the yeah, yeah, yeah. person who wrote you know the book on it, and go, "What do you think?" And I, I I'm not a smart person at all. I just regurgitate what smart people say. Um, I have faith that humanity will eventually go the same way. You, you know? You're smart in a different way, in that you're aggregating knowledge in a very expedient and accelerated manner. Hopefully. Um, but again, all I'm doing is listening to smart people. And that's Believe me, you are. That's <laughs> well, thank you. Nice thing anyone's ever said to me. That's what um, I <laughs> But yeah, back to it. Yeah, I, I think people will start to turn... Uh, um, uh, there was a huge... Uh, during the Brexit campaign, there was a, a famous moment where uh, Michael Gove was like, oh, I think the public are sick of experts. And I think that was a moment for me. I was like, oh my God, Really? Uh, I think we will start to turn back to our experts when things get more dire I think we're all very comfortable at the moment but when Mm. things get really bad that's when people will start to turn to what to actually do and start to think about things because right now we're in a comfy enough position we don't have to worry about it you know we don't worry about what's happening in Latvia but the Latvians do Um, yeah I I have faith in humanity that eventually we will come to a point where we have to start thinking quite dramatically about decisions made hmm all the decisions that probably frustrate us on an everyday level mm. will get forced. Yes. You know, you... Instead of the pissing around that essentially you're talking about. Yes. We, we piss I mean, around... Let's, let's fight. We, we do. We piss around the dumbest It's like one big fucking game of risk. Yes. <laughs> right now, you know, we're all worried about who's owning Australia when another country is consolidating all the other continents in a game of risk. Yes. You know, that's what boggles my mind is we should always be looking for that aircraft carrier because there's too many battleships that we just keep focusing on. Mm. The US is particularly bad for it. They fo- they love to focus on social issues. So, they, you know, like, I-, I was on a US panel show the other day with one of the presidential candidates and I was chatting with him and it was, you know, they were chatting about uh, US uh, foreign policy in Afghanistan and, and the Middle East. And I pointed out very quickly that, no, 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 that's not going to work because that's going to immediately force Russia to do this and this and this. And then and as soon as he came on the back foot, he asked me about abortion. Didn't answer my question, just went straight to abortion. Now, what do you think about abortion? I went, ooh, interesting. Because what, you've tried, what they try to do quite often is go, I'm not going to win that fight. I'm going to go fight on something that, you know, it doesn't matter. It's going to polarize and sit, you know, right there. I'm not going to change anyone's mind. Yeah. But, you know, I can talk to I'm blue about abortion, but I don't think I'm going to change a lot of yeah. people's minds on the subject. Um, and that's what a lot of people do. If they think they're going to lose something, they'll force another social issue. Because yeah, oh, social yeah. issues are much harder to debate. You know, whether you... Well, it's human nature, isn't it? When you pin yes. a friend down about their behavior yes. on something. And then just when you think you're going to see that dawning epiphany light, and yeah. they're like, oh, fuck that. I'll go and talk about something else. Yes. And that's essentially what you do. Exactly. Shit, we're not getting anywhere with this. Which I'm not at a, at a party. Trust me, I'm not. <laughs> I don't yeah, go yeah. in the party being like, we got to focus about Pakistan, man. But yeah. yeah. Um, you know, when it comes to politicians, people running for office and, and going for it, these people need to be held accountable. 100%. Um, you know, these we, we keep electing guys who are dumb as rocks um, because, you know, they, they... The best thing I can ever sum up politics, particularly in Western countries, is a lot of our politicians have the right answer but not the correct answer. Mm. So, for instance, you can be... I don't believe in climate change or, or you, you know, I don't believe in any of... I don't believe in that. That's not the correct answer. It's proven that it's a thing. Uh, but it's the right answer if you want to get a bunch of mining money and you want to get a friend, friends on the Mineral Council. Yes. So that's the right answer and you get the right funding and you get the right nominations. And this is what people tend to kind of focus on is, is these little tiny little questions that have the right answer. So mm. a lot of these, for instance, politicians in the US are very anti-abortion. But they're the same guys who usually you know, bang their mistress and then the mistress gets an abortion. It's not because they have the correct answer. If they had the right one, they know that by yeah. harping on the abortion thing, it's a dog whistle for "I am religious and I will fund, I will keep, you know, the Catholic Church or the Christian mm. Christian Church very happy, and I would like some of that money, please." Yeah. And unfortunately, we live in a world where money is directly affecting politics. On politics, there. Um, so I don't want to. Half the time, I can't be asked to talk about left or right. Or oh, no, it's it's I, exhausting, and it's just a waste of time. And, it, and it's also, I also find it frustrating because again, it's look, like, let's talk about this over here. Mm. When part of the time, I find, well, let's have a discussion about the political 
mm. infrastructure system paradigm because yeah. to me it doesn't seem to work the trouble is that we need that i agree like our, our democracy is fundamentally broken uh, in its current format i don't even think it's current format if you go yeah. back to the original yeah, ideas yeah, yeah. of democracy you know democritus when it came in in greece was funded was decided by rich people because the rich people knew that they could you know in the very first elections they would go around and they'd buy people you know meat and uh, barley and and go you know here's uh, some meat uh, i hope that i have your vote coming up and they used to buy elections and the, so the rich people managed to you know uh you know, get their way and get into power without having to have royal or noble blood. You know, effectively the landowners and the rich people manage to hold power that way. Uh, I think this is not a symptom. This is the thing that's baked into the cake. Yes. We are doubling down on a lot of those things. You know, there's a lot of thumbs that can be put on the scale with these things, um, with most electoral systems, including Australia's. Um, but Yes, this, our democracy is fundamentally broken, but what's the alternative? And mm. that's what I love to, when I get on, stuck with, you know, I don't just fight right-wing guys, I fight ultra-lefts as well. And you know, I stuck on these greeny panels all the time and they go, man, we just need to have like a commune system, man. Like, we just need to get rid of democracy, man. And I go, okay, what would you replace it with? I don't really know, man. That's the problem. Yeah. What do you replace democracy with? It's like the Curtis film hypernormalization, where everybody knows things are fucked. Yes. But they don't know what the alternative is, so you just carry on regardless. Precisely. With this great, with this great sense of... It's also, it, it's also the boiling frog principle. Mm. You know, if you want to boil a frog, if you throw the frog in the water when it's hot, the frog jumps out. Yeah. But if you chuck the frog in the water and then turn it up slowly, he doesn't notice. The frog will actually stay in the water until it boils to death. Yes. You know, we're slowly amping up politics and we're slowly eroding things. So it's just a little bit, oh, it's just, it's just, oh, it's just a little bit in censorship. It's just a little bit internet censorship. Oh, it's just, oh, it's just this tiny little workers' rights thing. Oh, we'll just take that. Oh, maybe you can't yeah. have that. Yeah. And it just erodes and erodes. And it's not till you look back 30 years ago and you go, hey, well, we moved pretty dramatically from this place to this place. Yeah. And it's not so cool now. Pardon? And it's not so cool now. No. Is it but, a little wonder that people have mental health problems? Oh, huge amounts. <laughs> and we don't fund it. No. Of course um, not. It boggles my mind how little this country does for mental health. Mm. Um, but that's a whole other debate to have. But yes, we are living in interesting times. And all the history buffs I do shows with are all like, this is pretty close to 1922. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I know. 1922. So right before, you know, where these all... Uh, 1922 was a very interesting point of history. We'd just come out of the First World War. Uh, we kind of pieced the world semi back together, but not really. Uh, and then all these left-wing left wing parties came up and then they all just imploded. They kept fighting amongst themselves and fighting on dumb issues and the right just swept in. And you, you, you can see in the 30s where you have this right sweeping mm. and it leads to World War Two, and then a pretty dramatic... You know, also the Depression as well. Mm. Uh, the Depression came obviously beforehand, but all, you know, all these right-wing isolationists came in, the economy collapsed... And when dark, times get dark, people tend to fling one side or the other. Yeah. You know, when people are, are stable, so when the world was at its most stable, let's you know, recent times, uh, it was like 2001, you know, that kind of area, they tend to go for middle of the road candidates. You know, they go for your Bill Clintons, your Tony Blairs, those kind of guys. Yeah. When the world is rough kilter and everyone's panicking and everyone's worried and, and things are bad, that's when you start getting your Mussolini's, your Hitler's, your Trump's, your Stalin. Mm. Well, Stalin obviously wasn't elected, but you know you tend to go for but, far, yeah. well away from the center candidates. Mm. Uh, and we're already starting to see that. And as soon as you go away from the center, then you start also putting the whole economy off balance as well, and things can get out of hand pretty quickly. From somebody who pissed up bought a ticket to go to Russia <laughs> yep. to somebody who's now on frequently on panel discussions etc 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 mm. what have you learned about yourself in the journey uh, I can hold my vodka pretty well um, <laughs> that's the main one um, I've learned that people are generally the same we generally all have the same no matter where if I go to the, the deserts of Uzbekistan or you know the streets of Belarus or you know Paris or even Perth people are generally the same 
We all mm. want the same things. We all want comfortable living. We all want our friends. Mm. We all want our family. We want our, our, our girlfriend. We all want buddies. Uh, most people like burgers and most people like vodka. Um, you know, I think wherever you go, I have that faith in humanity that generally people aren't going to kill you. People are generally up, actually happy to chat with you. You know, it may cost you a few cigarettes for your life, but, you know, general, people are generally pretty nice wherever you go. Mm. Uh, and I think if we get to know the other side and we get to know the other spectrum we actually can solve a lot of problems i mean i have friends who, who work for both parties and i have friends who are ultra right and i have friends who are ultra left and you know i can sit at a dinner table and have good chats and we can debate stuff and i think a lot of the time you know these guys just need someone else to get out of their bubble you know when you sit in a little bubble and you only talk with other communists you watch them just circle around and they just have f- further you know increasing ideas that are just ugh. and then you know when you have someone who actually chats to them and gets them out of their bubble and goes well that might not work but what about this I like this bit of your plan but I don't like this bit because that'll make this Mm. that's when you actually get things achieved uh, by Mm. sort of helping both sides realize the error of their ways Mm. Uh, and I think we can do that we just need to get people to chat more with the other side and get out of their bubbles a bit Mm. because otherwise we're going to let a small amount of people agitate the masses oh of course and we're already seeing that I mean, every time, you know, it's like, oh, there's a Twitter hashtag. It's like 30 people. You know, if, you know, we take things way too seriously and we let little people, you know, loud voices make big, you know, stomping. Yeah. Uh, like, for instance, there's this huge outcry. Oh, we need Adani. We need Adani. But the actual people who are really pro Adani are a very, very, very small group of people. They're just very vocal and they've got very good advice. Um, you know how is Adani being open going to help someone living in, in you know, South Perth? It's not. Hmm. It might hurt us uh, with, if climate change uh, kicks in and does, the, does what it's going to do. Um, but, you know, small groups of people can be very loud. Hmm. What's, um, what's your future view over the next several years for yourself and Redline Podcast? I, I, I don't know. Again, I'm not a future reader. Uh, I know that the show is off to uh, Moldova, Russia, Hong Kong in uh, next, next week. Uh, mm. We're flying out next week to go do all those. Um, so I think the show will, will keep going, and I'm sure we'll probably, you know, every episode so far is we're watching the little uh, listens go exponentially, which is, you know, beyond belief. I didn't think, you know, we're on episode five now, and we're pulling like six k six k listens at episode at the moment, which is didn't think anything was going like that was going to happen. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think it'll get bigger and better and we'll have better guests. And obviously once you get better, then you can get better guests and yeah, hopefully yeah, we can yeah. cover bigger stories and I can have more time to do it. And yeah, I think that would be, the, that would be what I'd like to see. Uh, I think no matter what, even if the show doesn't happen, I'll still travel to interesting places because the vodka is cheap um, and it's always a good story out there. Mm. Other than vodka... What does Michael do to keep yourself sane amongst all of this? I was playing as a touring musician for a very long time. Uh, you know, I played bass in a few bands. Uh, I also just track on other people's stuff. Um, music, big thing for me. Um, so yeah, just generally I bounce between music and uh, music and research. Uh, also, love, I like learning languages. Um, so that's always a good bit of fun for me as well. But generally, it's music. I'm a big music guy. Um, hmm. mostly kind of rock music that's my, my jam and the last question that I ask all my guests yep. is everything that you've learned and, and we've talked about etc if you could take one little nugget of knowledge and upload it into the collective consciousness so we all get it what would that be? it's not about the what it's about the why if you figure out the why you learn far more than figure out the what. And that's, that is the crux of everything I do. You know, the cool figuring like, you know, Oh, they sent a battleship here. That's cool. That's a what, why did they send that there is far more of a story and it's far more interesting. You can learn a lot more from the why than you ever can from the what. So that would be, if I could give anyone a statement to, to go with, that would be it. Awesome. People want to listen to the podcast find out 
reach out to you? Where do they do that? Uh, we're on all the socials is at, at Redline Pod. So obviously Instagram, Facebook, uh, you know, all those sort of ones. Uh, you can listen to us on Google, App, uh, Apple, Spotify. Um, all the places. All the places we're always about. Uh, otherwise, with the amount of shows, with um, panels and jumping on, I'm sure you'll see me jumping somewhere giving depressing talks about depressing subjects. Um, at this point, it could be called The Red Line or just Things That Make Michael Sad for an Hour, starring <laughs> Michael Hilliard. I think that would be an interesting name for the podcast as well. Um, but yeah, generally, you can find us on most major platforms. Michael, thank you very much for taking the time to come and talk to me today. No, it's been absolutely um, great. Thanks for having me. To get such a condensed, to listen to your story, but also get such a condensed view of how things are playing out. Mm. And and I think even just listening to this, someone could quite quickly go, oh, that's the whole I point. start to get a whole lot of stuff going on. And yes, whilst at times it could be considered depressing, at the same time it's very empowering because you have... Mm the knowledge so thank you very much for your time I wish you very well with the Red Line podcast and I'd really like you to come back at some point in the future and We'd lo- I'd love to come back I'm always happy to help another Perth podcast because just there's not enough podcasts coming out of Perth indeed I think looking into it there's like a couple of movie reviews and some odd yep. ones but yeah mostly everyone's doing movie reviews out here so it's, it's great yeah or talking talk. about digital marketing oh, so many digital marketing buyer. or Bitcoin Bitcoin's the other one there's always a bunch of dudes doing Bitcoin oh stuff. yes Yes, yes, yes. Um, so we need to, we we need more podcasts that talk about the real things. Oh, even just to inter, inter uh, talk to other people. Like it was just, I, I like hearing from other people in Perth. I think it's a fantastic city, and and hearing what other Perth people are doing is is interesting. Which is why I like your show. Um, but yeah, I, I, as long as you don't spend your time reviewing the Joker, because I think I've been sent a million requests that's, for that's not, people movie review shows. That's not in the focus. <laughs> Mark, thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. Cheers.